Welcome back, everybody, to the Oakland A's franchise on MLB The Show 23. We're in the month of August right now. The A's are 58 and 56, and the season is beginning to wind down. We already traded away some veterans at the deadline and are now trying to see just what development can we get out of this roster by the end of the year, and will we play well enough to have a chance to sneak into the postseason. We've got some new players to check out, such as Miguel Vargas after the trade to the Los Angeles Dodgers, sending them Cody Bellinger, a rebuilt Cody Bellinger, and bringing back Miguel Vargas. Now, there's a lot I want to get around to today, and at the end of this video, I'm going to spend about 10 to 12 minutes talking about what I've been doing to the new stadium. There'll be a good update later on. There's still more to do, but I feel really good about the progress that I just made. But what I wanted to open this episode with is actually some feedback I got on the previous video, and it's something I really should have thought of when I was talking about it last episode, but it's been an issue trying to really fit the defense together and get everybody into their proper positions and set this up the right way. You know, Miguel Vargas really shouldn't be in the outfield, but he has to be just given Soderstrom's playing first and Geloff's at third and then Arise is at second. However, of course, Tyler Soderstrom is meant to be a catcher and first base is just a secondary position for him. His defense has been improving and I do think it makes a lot more sense to get him back at catcher and think about that being his full-time role next season. We got a couple decent options here in Daniel Susak, who has hit 268 this year with limited power, but honestly, Soderstrom's value increases tremendously when you consider what he offers at the plates, but at the catcher position instead of first base. So I think down the stretch, and I don't know if it'll be today, but maybe I'll get him a start today there. I want to get Tyler Soderstrom ready to be a full-time catcher once again, and this is going to open things up to where Vargas could go to second base even. Luis Arise could play first, maybe not play it extremely well, but your worst defender can usually get by at first base. You also have the option of just playing Vladimir Guerrero at first base. There's nothing wrong with that. He's very durable, has good defense, and that opens up your DH role, which would really be interesting. Like, imagine if we could have Soderstrom and Vladdy in the order, and then you consider somebody else with some legit pop as that DH. I think that's what could put the offense over the top, but I don't think we have that player ready to step in right now. Unless you think Miguel Cabrera could play a little DH here down the stretch. I know he won't do it with power, but oh, that is so tempting. I cannot wait to see Miguel Cabrera hopefully play this role that we're all envisioning. But I definitely think for the future of this series and just the, the fitting of the team, Soderstrom's got to go back to catcher. And actually, you can use the player search tool here to really see how different your players are compared to others at their positions. So if we want to just focus on Tyler Soderstrom and be like, well, how good is his power compared to all the other catchers in the league? He has 68 power against righties. How many other catchers can say that? 15. So he's already at the least league average when it comes to power against righties at the catching position. How many offer his blend of power against both handednesses? Now we're down to 12. So Soderstrom is already a slightly above average power hitting catcher when you consider that everybody else is at least tied or has more power than I'm using here in the player finder. But that shows you where he is right now development wise. And I think we're pretty happy with that being just a couple years into his career with obviously plenty of upward uh, potential. And I think when you're going to say re-sign a guy like we did with Soderstrom to eight mil a season, it's good to know in the grand scheme of things, how does he really stack up at the catcher position? And if we want to base it off of power here, we see he's above average, and given his age, he should end up being a lot better after some time. Let's, uh, I want to see the defense in comparison. So there are probably a couple hundred catchers who have at least a 60, and that's exactly what his fielding rating is. He's definitely a below average fielder right now but we're hoping that we'll obviously get a, a lot better. 
But I think we should be continuing on now with our season and oh my. I've already screwed this up twice. I've got a plan. Joe Michael has a complete game shutout in the works here in the Bronx, but it's one to nothing in the bottom of the ninth inning. I'm just here to watch. Put the controller down, kick back. It's like we're doing one of my Madden franchises over here. Vaughn rips one to left center field. And we'll see if he makes his way to second base. He does not, holding up at first. Uh-oh, is he getting pulled out? I think they have made the change to Domingo Acevedo. So it was not my fault this time. I'm going to watch this play out, though. I kind of want to see this experience and how this plays out. I've gotten a bunch of saves with Acevedo. I wouldn't mind watching one here. But the pressure is on with Vaughn on first base. Nice slider inside. Tried to front door it there, and he missed. Two and two to Oswaldo Cabrera. We've had like four straight foul balls. Two and two. Got him that time with the changeup. Acevedo facing Glaber Torres. And that front door slider is just not connecting yet. Bottom of the Yankees order trying to come through in the ninth. 1-0 from Acevedo and he holds back. Fouled back, and Acevedo battling here. Makes it 2-2. Two and two. Played at first. Soderstrom starts it. Game over. Acevedo slams the door in New York. It is a 1-0 Athletics win. So this time, we see Michael not get his shutout, but he actually gets the win. And no earned runs. It's still, well, it's still a shutout. He just didn't finish the whole game. Really good to see a two-hit day for Josh Baez as well. Two of our six in this game. Now, I was critical of our low-scoring offense last episode. That really hasn't changed. Since the All-Star break back on July 6th and 7th, we've only had two games where we've scored more than four runs. Yet, we've actually gotten hot because teams aren't scoring. We sweep the Yankees in New York, giving us a 60 and 56 record. Now our stumbles here out of the break began with a series against the Mariners, and we do lose the first game to them back at home. We then lose the very next game, giving us a little taste of reality. Michael comes back in his next start and helps shut down the Philadelphia Phillies. I want to see him finish the year strong, see if he can take that ERA down a notch or two. Vargas goes yards, so that may have been his first home run as a member of the A's with a two-hit, four-RBI day. Another eight innings of work from Joe Michael. And then we win a series against the Phillies. Daniel Susak's batting average is slipping down to 252, and if he's not really giving us any power, he needs to maintain a high average to still have value. He's not a guy that walks a ton either, so his on-base numbers aren't even great. Like, that ISO is gross. A 0.57 is like no pop. So do we make the move here with Soderstrom right now? I think it'd be good to get him some games here behind the dish. And at the same time, opens up what we can do at first base then. I looked up the new Max Muncy's uh, minor league stuff here. And I've only seen him play at second and short and then DHing. So he's not an option to become the first baseman. Just wanted to point out though that he's gained 12 total points in contact this year. His defense is at a really good spot. If he were hitting better, this would also be an interesting option to play Vladdy at first but give Shea Langoliers then a chance to just be a DH. But he's not really demonstrating the power, I think, to really take on that role. He's only slugged 358 this season with uh, 137 ISO. That's not really DH worthy. Man, I just got a dangerous idea. What if you DH Trey Sweeney and you brought someone like Max Muncy up? He could play short. 
We just lost a series to the Houston Astros. We're now 64 and 61. And then we lose the first three to the Tampa Bay Rays. It's a four game sweep and that sends us back under 500. Now we're gonna play the Minnesota Twins and I think I'd, I'd like to play this one actually. You know what, I love Target Field, but I just thought of something. One game, all right? We're playing this one inside of the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome. The two-time World Series champion Minnesota Twins will host us. Technically three because they won one as the Washington Senators. But the most important stat is they've won zero in my lifetime. I was born in 92, a year after the last Minnesota major men's sports team won anything of relevance. Definitely got them in the wrong uniforms for this one, but we're going to play this one in the Metrodome here. It's nostalgic for me. I am a Twins fan for those of you that aren't aware and... Obviously, I grew up watching him play here, not Target Field. And also, right field is a little bit of the inspiration here for our new stadium. Very loosely, though. It honestly doesn't emulate it very much. But uh, we do have ourselves a wall in right. Now, that's not actually a solid wall in right field. It's uh, a 7-foot wall. And then an 18-foot tarp to extend the wall. That's called the baggy. So a lot of home runs uh, in other parks were instead hit off of that big baggy. And I wanted to have a little bit of that in our stadium. You know, it's a little nostalgic and you'll all get to the stadium later on. You'll see what I have in store for this one. But we lead off with Luis Arise facing Joe Ryan and he strikes him out. Miguel Vargas hitting 223. Hoping he can be one of our future cornerstones. I know with Joe Ryan, we're going to see a lot of fastballs, and they're not going to be the fastest, but does have some movement and knows where to keep it. 0-1. Out in front. That's high, and now the count runs 3-2 and two as we wait for something as good as that second pitch. And don't get it. That's a ball four to Miguel Vargas. Guerrero hits it on the ground to short, and Correa starts a routine double play. But we got Joe Michael on the mound today. He has five victories, and three of them have already come in this episode, I'm pretty sure. 4.8 ERA, it's starting to click a bit more here down the stretch. And he faces the youngest member of the Twins roster. It's Adolfo Cairo. I did increase his potential after his great season last year. So the Twins got themselves a really good player that they took uh, a few drafts ago. I can't remember exactly which. Right by him at 98. And the two-strike curveball is low. Returning to the fastball, and it's out to the gap in right center and run down by Connor Capel. I'm not a fan of this broadcast angle. We're actually going to be changing this up. I like this a lot better. This is pitcher offset. Like, some stadiums have a really good broadcast angle. Others don't. This just feels like I'm right into the action. This is pretty cool. Two and two to Amart. Chop foul. And the fastball popped up to Capel in right. No problem. And that'll bring up Carlos Correa hitting 284. Michael can't make the play and it's past to rise a base hit. I will say that some of our dimensions are uh, similar to what the Twins had here in the Metrodome. But I think that our stadium might be a little more home run friendly. Buxton out to left field. And this is going to send Vargas back where he makes the catch. Yeah, left field here is fairly deep in the dome. It's 343. I think that's a little bit more than average. But might have made sense just given the... Uh, the indoor nature of the stadium and everything. Yeah. Tyler Soderstrom's catching today, and he will be hitting fourth at the same time. 
it just really hasn't clicked this year like it did last season for Soderstrom. So hopefully it's just a bit of a sophomore slump that he can rebound from. Ryan delivering 2-2. Two -two. On the ground to Correa. That was a very good slider, and it's four up, four down. Geloff is still hitting in the 300s, by the way. I'd love to see him stay there through the end of the season. Come on! I want to get rewarded for not biting on that pitch. Right back up the middle, a slow one for Correa. Got him at first. There's a 97 by Joey Meneses. What if we don't even go off speed here? 0 oh and 2. And he waves at it upstairs, 100 miles per hour. Definitely with this high velo, we should try to work the top of the zone a bit more. Capel back makes the catch at the track. Right in front of the baggy. And a slow one for Geloff, and that'll make for a very quick second inning. I'm hoping we can hit one off the baggy today for old time's sake, but if we hit it over, I won't be heartbroken. Connor Capel is the batter. I love to see Ryan's ratings on some of his pitches because he certainly is around the edges better than most pitchers I tend to see. He doesn't overwhelm with velocity, but it's just not convenient most of the time to swing. 0-2. Oh that one's better, but jam to left center field, and Correa decides he'll make that play too. Trey Sweeney hitting 236. He has a dozen homers on the year. He and Soderstrom are going to be kind of the keys here. Two really young, high upside players that we need to help bring us to that next level, and they really didn't this season. Popped up. And that's going to be Martin's play. Larnick slashes one to the gap in left center field. And it should be two. Could be three if he wants it. And Larnick hits the brakes. They nailed his uh, batting stance, by the way. Like, they do a good job generally with batting stances. But every now and then I see some where it's like, that looks perfect, and Larnix was one of them. I guess in this series, the Twins brought back Mitch Garver from the Rangers. I like Garver. A catcher who gives you some power is always exciting. One and two in the dirt, and he goes around. Soderstrom flicks it over to third base, and it's a very unconventional double play. Well, actually, no. I needed to tag the runner or throw to first, and we did neither. We got the lead runner, though, so we still got the best possible outcome. Could I have thrown to first base, though, to get a really unconventional double play? I've just never been put in that situation before with that exact play in sequence. I want to see your top tips for playing with a pitcher like Joe Michael. Tell me what I've been doing wrong I, like, sometimes I, I do want to throw low and not keep the, the ball here in the wheelhouse. Got him! Strike three. Certainly not throwing a lot of off-speed right now. The fastball's doing the job. The changeup isn't even there right now. I, I might work on it here with two outs. Or maybe against the bottom of their order, I'll try to reset that changeup a bit better. That was a nice thing about sometimes facing a pitcher in older games of the show is I would use that at bat to just work on the pitches that have low confidence. It's by him! Strike three! The A's had no hits the first trip through the order. Arise center field where Buxton measures it for the first out. A drive, hammer to left, and gone! Vladimir Guerrero Jr. breaks up the no-hitter with number 29 on the season. 447 feet. 
when you want to rely on that low 90s fastball as much as Joe Ryan does, you're going to be at risk of this happening a couple times here and there. And now one sent deep to right field off the bat of Soderstrom, but it's caught by Cairo. Usually it's this third or fourth inning that becomes the problem inning. Whoa, Vladdy makes a nice catch. Those are tough. But oftentimes these are the problem innings for Michael. There tends to be one that just gets out of hand with a walk and four straight hits seemingly out of nowhere. Buxton fouls it off. And now we'll see if we can catch him fishing. Only eight pitches out of the zone today for Joe Michael. And he strikes out Buxton on three. Wasn't even trying to throw it that perfectly. Yeah, he's way late. Good luck catching up to him at 100 there. And then when he comes back, 97 at the top of the zone. It's not a whole lot easier. The 0-2 now. We'll see if these curveballs can start to uh, come around for us. We'll play with another one. Not going to bite. And he hits it weakly to arise. And it's four great innings of work so far. It's been fun in real life because the first series for the Twins coming out of the break has been in Oakland against the A's. Geloff, left field. Hit weekly. So in real life, the A's just called up Tyler Soderstrom and Zach Geloff, each to make their debuts in the same game. So I've now gotten to see Soderstrom's first career hit, Geloff's first career hit, and Geloff's hitting just like he does in the series. You know, he shows power, but maybe not home run power. Like his first hit was uh, a right center gapper that turned into a double that was nearly a home run. They reviewed it to see if it was. And then he hit a triple last night on another hard hit ball to the outfield. It is fun, you know, you get attached to these players in the franchise and it even affects like your interest in them in real life. And I, I think that's happened to me my entire life playing these games. And it's probably never going to stop because I just think that's really cool, especially when I feel a game like the show really does a good job of you know, projecting these players and, you know, I'm, I'm playing with Geloff in the game and I feel like in real life he's playing the same way that he does in the game. But it was last night's game that I spent uh, almost that entire game working on the stadium, watching the Twins and A's battle it out. Lifted by Capel on a 3-0 fastball. Buxton makes the catch. So I'm excited to show you what I have here with the stadium after this game is over. But hopefully we can get ourselves a nice win here. I feel like I haven't had that signature outing with Michael myself. And I'm hoping that we're uh, on our way to it here. We're bottom of the fifth inning right now. This has been a very swiftly moving game. Miranda 1-2. Good curveball from Joe. Maybe that increases that confidence slightly. Now we're going with the changeup. And that's strike three. Six Ks in the game for Joe Michael, and he's only at 47 pitches. This is one of the rare at-bats. He does not get a first pitch strike to Jorge Polanco. There's a fastball. In the air for Capel. Another out. Well, he doesn't get a call there that he deserved. He hasn't walked anybody yet, but now in danger of walking Larnick. And now a full count. I say we stick with the straight fastball. 3-2, and it's headed to the gap. Capel can't cut it off. Larnick, he doubled earlier to the opposite gap. He's got two now. Brings up Mitch Garver. He hits ninth. Not going to be pitching around him here to get to the leadoff man, Cairo. That's by him. 
Ooh, good pitch there, but no call. Come on, man. How do you not swing at that? That's impossible to lay off. Got him that time. Whatever works. I wouldn't like that call either. I feel like I've seen a lot of managers get tossed on that strike three. Here's Trey Sweeney's numbers. He doesn't like hitting lefties too much. I'm also not starting him against lefties because... He wasn't playing well when he was the starter there, so eventually just go play Logan Davidson on those days instead. Give Trey an off day. 0-1, and now 0-2. Got him with a breaking ball. Did the Twins actually win two World Series as the Senators? They show 69 and 70. I couldn't remember if it was one or two. Must be two. One and two with Ryan missing low. And a lazy fly ball. Man, we're putting it in the air, but these are the easiest plays these outfielders have ever made. I don't think Ryan's leaving anytime soon. We're not putting his pitch count in a bad spot whatsoever. Just not making hard contact. Hard enough contact. Just as we all expected here, a Joe Michael, Joe Ryan pitcher's duel in the Metrodome. This is going to be one of the fastest plays, or fastest games I've played, I think, in the show. Got him looking! The lefties have really struggled outside of Larnick. Just feel like whenever you get that first pitch strike here with Michael, you're unstoppable. Two strikes on Martin. Pitch 71. And weakly hit towards Geloff. Could have barehanded that one. Yep. They're late on it. And waving at a changeup now. Just like that. 0-2 on Correa. And weakly hit. The same play for Geloff. Six scoreless for Joe Michael. We have one hit through six innings, and we're winning. Here's Vargas. Uh-oh. Hit hard to center field. Actually seeing Buxton retreat a few steps, but literally just a few. If you want offense, Vladimir Guerrero supplying most of it today. He and Larnick. And there's his second hit. Drilled the center field base hit. For a brief moment, I was thinking about what if I win this game with one hit? I'd probably never do that again. Now I got one of these lefties up here. I want to hook one to the baggie. Pitch inside here, Joe. I try to lay off of it and I can't. I love me a good curveball and a bad one too. And there's one out to right, but not deep enough. Rolled to third by Geloff, and that's seven innings for Joe Ryan, allowing two hits and one run. Joe Michael now trying to match him with a seventh inning. I don't think any team here has their bullpen in operation. The Twins do have two in their bullpen, I can tell, getting warm. We don't have anybody yet. Might be wise to get somebody warm just in case. Strike two on Buxton. I know exactly where to put this. He didn't go around, though. Strike three. Just can't throw it better. And it's out to Capel. We are done in the seventh. Joe Michael with another shutout in progress. Wow, they brought in Giovanni Moran. So, Joe Ryan's day is done. 
And now it's a lefty, making it, a, I feel like, a little less likely I can hit one off the baggie and right. Three and one now to Josh Baez. We haven't had too many base runners. I wouldn't mind getting a couple here. And it's weekly hit to Correa. This is dreadful. We're going to make a substitution here with Denzel Clark coming in for Connor Capel. Trying to get across that second run and we'll get our platoon advantage here. And Clark's hitting 275. And it's on the ground, hit very slowly. The Metrodome turf was way faster than that. Immersion broken. Used to have hitters back in the day like Luis Castillo who would just pound the ball right off the dirt near home plate and you'd get this really high bounce and a bunch of infield singles. It was awesome. Sweeney strikes out and we're going bottom eight. And Clark will slide over into right field. We will get someone warm. You just never know. And I'm probably going to get uh, Victor Gonzalez going. 83 pitches in for Joe Michael as we get underway here in the eighth inning. Jorge Polanco in the air for Baez. Another one. Let's watch out for Larnick now. Two for two with a pair of doubles. Down the middle. And on the outside edge. 65 strikes and 21 balls for Joe Michael. Larnick holds back. Just missing high and now a full count. Larnick trying to reach again. And he fouls off the changeup. And again the 3-2. He doesn't go around. And that is the first walk issued for Joe Michael all game. Julien's going to come in to run. And now Garver. Big cut there trying to put the Twins on top. There we go. Nailing the bottom of the zone. Love to get a ground ball here. Lifted for Clark. He's back. Out number two. And now Cairo, who lines it to Guerrero, and we're through the eighth inning. Joe Michael will be coming out for the ninth, hoping to preserve a shutout. But will it be a one-run lead, or will the A's find a little more offense facing Jorge Alcala? Alcala does throw a potential triple-digit fastball. We lead off with Shea Langoliers. Jeez, I don't know what I'm doing. I have two hits, though. Are you surprised at this point I'm not putting great swings on the ball? I couldn't lay off. Two quick strikes here on a rise. Muscled into center field and Buxton makes the catch. Vargas has to start something here if we're to get any more runs. And he does hit it through the infield. Base hit to right. Yeah, that slider is hard to lay off. I don't know. His release is a little bit harder to pick up than the other pitchers that we've seen. And there's one to center field, and Buxton never had to move. Bottom of the ninth inning, here we come. We have seen many close calls this year with Joe Michael trying to get complete game shutouts. He will not be able to do it in under 100 pitches, but he's only at 98, and he faces the two, three, four hitters. Martin with the drive, sending Baez out to center. He's under, one down. But now you've got the Twins' best hitters in Correa and Buxton back-to-back. -back. Pitch 100, off the plate. Tapped foul. Did that hit him? 
He went around, though. He swung at one that hit him. And Correa falls behind. The one, two. To Baez. Two down, and it's up to Buxton. How about this, everybody? Joe Michael versus Byron Buxton. A complete game shutout on the line. Pitch 104. Got the edge. Just enough. The 0-1. Popped up. Vargas to the Twins bullpen. And he secures it. Joe Michael. Complete game shutout in the Metrodome. After how many close calls and how many games I jumped into due to a critical situation trying to complete the shutout and even just in the beginning of this episode deciding we'll watch and Michael has the shutout broken up in the ninth inning but here against the twins we go the distance all 27 outs no critical situation and Michael gets the job done for a 1-0 A's win. I mean, the story tells itself here. That, that's so awesome. I love the show. One walk, nine strikeouts, three hits, out-dueling Joe Ryan. And we win with just three hits on the day. Here's the analysis for Joe Michael. 81% strikes thrown on that fastball. Wasn't trying to be too perfect. Just trying to avoid throwing it in the, the middle of the nine boxes there. Just trying to keep it out of there as much as possible. And I think we did a really good job of that. All the hits given up were on fastballs, but we didn't really throw a lot of other stuff, honestly. 16 swings and misses. Did a really good job on that lower leftmost zone. The strikeouts were primarily on pitches more so down than up. 14 total chases. Really awesome game. At last, we've given Joe Michael that complete game shutout experience. Man, that's one of the highlights of the season for me. And he's having a really strong stretch now. He's gotten hot. The ERA's down to four and a half. The strikeouts are on the rise. There's the development across the board. Still a couple things to work on, but he's giving us those high-level outings now. And that was the very first complete game shutout of his career. I'm really happy we got to have that moment in an episode. As we look ahead, September call-ups are in 10 days, and we have the rosters expanding. At AAA, I think you have a few guys who could be in consideration. Henry Vasquez has gotten cold lately, but I'm thinking, like, is there one pitcher and one position player we can bring up? Maybe George Williams comes up. He's pitched really well this year, was an all-star. And then one of Miguel Cabrera, maybe, or Max Muncy. Maybe Muncy makes more sense because the defense and the playing time upside, you know, in the near future is there. I might even make shortstop his primary position because that's what he's listed as. And honestly, the idea of DHing Sweeney to play Muncy at short is a possibility we should consider. Vladdy just needs one more home run to mash 30 on the season. Arise has 13, Sweeney 12, Soderstrom 11. I was not counting on Luis Arise being second in homers this year, but we did trade away Seth Brown and Cody Bellinger already. And speaking of, Cody Bellinger still has not homered in Los Angeles and has fallen into a pretty serious cold streak, it would seem. Although he is up to an 81 overall, so that's up even further Seven points now since we signed him three years ago. But at the moment, he does not seem to be hitting well for the Dodgers. Seth Brown is in Toronto now, and he's at 18 home runs. But it, I can't remember how many he had with us prior to the trade. But his ratings are on a steep decline here, and he really cannot hit lefties anymore. It does seem he's still showing some value, though, with his power, and he's reaching base at like a league average level so he's still like a decent starter to have as an extra power option 
We traded the Guardians Christian Arroyo in the offseason, and he's been on the decline again this year, and he's playing about the exact same as he did with us. Maybe even a little less home run power, though. Teoscar Hernandez has belted 28 home runs and might have a 30-100 and 100 season here in New York. So he's at the peak now. He's played outstanding since leaving. We traded Nick Gordon to the Braves, and I don't know that much has changed. Like, I think he's just picking up where he left off, still playing at a pretty decent level now with them. And Zach Jackson, it looks like his ERA is even lower than it was with us. So, they got a good bullpen arm out of it. Looking at our starting rotation again, Michael Soroka has a 2.68 ERA. That's up uh, a little bit since the All-Star break, but it was extremely low before. And now Joe Michael is creeping towards having the second best ERA out of our starting pitchers. We've got Luis Medina here at a 4.38. It seems like the level of play he showed last year is again who he's been this season. Like these numbers are He's the same player. Nothing's changed. Cole Phillips is somebody else to think about, too. I mean, we traded for him last episode, and I think he's definitely prepared for uh, his big league debut. Would be nice to get some info on him before next season and having to make off-season decisions at pitcher. I think given the uncertainty we have in this organization with guys like Waldachuk and Mitch Keller, Luis Medina, I think seeing Phillips before the end of the year is a must. Elliot Hughes has been down at double A this year. He's an A potential prospect, but I'm pretty sure he was like a four-year college graduate when we drafted him. This has been a really slow year for his development. He began the year with an even higher ERA than this. It's finally come down, but he's 5-10 with only 9 quality starts. So, with 23 starts and only 9 being quality, it's been a very up-and-down season for Elliot Hughes. And this is pushing his timetable back even more. But that'll do it for this portion of the video. I wanted to close with a look at where the stadium progress is. And that stadium's going to be debuting next season. The last time I showed off the stadium, there wasn't a whole lot done. And there's still more that I have to do. But I've spent a lot of time figuring out how all these tools work. And what the limitations are inside of the stadium creator. I have finally really figured out what I've wanted with this stadium, and I made a lot more progress, like I said last night, watching the A's play against the Minnesota Twins. I have wanted to figure out how to get this left field corner just right, and I've come to the conclusion that the only way to really do it is to knock out some of the seating, because you cannot really manipulate the wall that goes in foul territory without adjusting the actual outfield fence and that changes the entire stadium so getting the stadium dimensions right and the outfield finalized was really my goal with this step i'll fill in some of this empty space and can you imagine having to sit behind this pillar i then wanted to bring in the center field fence and have that be 405 feet away from home plate the left field corner is going to be at 335, and I've adjusted the height of the walls to be about what you see in the majors, like 7 or 8 feet. I believe ours are at 8 feet. Then you gotta get all of this to snap together, and that can be a little pain at times, but it's really fun to see everything start to come together. So we do have our outfield seating here set, and then I messed with the wall more to just make it look as clean as possible, and that took a few revisions. I put down more seats here just to be a guide, as I wanted to straighten out the wall and clean up that little area leading towards the batter's eye in center field. So this was just meant to be temporary and a guide. But you have all these little spots along the wall that you can manipulate, and the annoying part is like wanting to straighten out sections of the fence when you have all those things to adjust. Now, when it comes to the batter's eye, I feel like the one I had at the very beginning is my favorite so far, but you're not able to push it up against that outfield fence, I noticed. So it always tries to stay, you know, like five feet away from the furthest point. And I feel like it would look better if it were flush with the wall, 
So it has me wondering if I should switch up which batter Zai I'm trying to use. We'll talk a lot about right field as well. This has been one of the main areas of the stadium I wanted to get right. But with left field more or less being finalized, I was able to slap on this outside piece to really make it look finished. And then I realized, oh, I didn't line it up with the foul pole nicely. So now I have to pull everything over a little bit and adjust the wall. So that took a little extra time, but I think I managed to uh, do so pretty well. Put that same piece on this spot here. And I know that the seating just kind of ending here and not being up against the... The wall doesn't really look the best, but it's kind of the, the compromise we have to make here. Opening up that corner, I think we can put some other things in there. But as far as just continuing the seating all the way through, I don't think there's a way to do it nicely without altering dimensions. So I've also been looking at scoreboards and different props I can put into the stadium. Less so with the props because I've been focusing mostly on the function of the stadium and the outfield fence. The props are more or less going to be how I fill things in at the very end. But for sure, I want a good scoreboard in this stadium. Something you can see from the batting camera at home plate and see your stats and see everything you see at certain stadiums like Kansas City who has a really good scoreboard view but I feel like putting the scoreboard right here just doesn't quite seem right and I don't want to block a bunch of the seating I wanted to then look at this right field wall and delete all this because I needed to extend the seating and the wall itself and here I deleted the parking garage and there is no undo button that's one of the most annoying things here in the editor so you have to save often by the way, that uh, that big green thing is just a scoreboard turned backwards. So I had to reload my save and do a lot of the stuff I already showed you all over again. But I wanted to add some seating here in right field and extend the blue wall. So I talked about how this is kind of, you know, a throwback to, you know, like the right field wall at the Metrodome. It's not exactly that. It is a right field wall. It's not going to be as tall. The one at the Metrodome, including the baggie, I think it was about 25 feet or so. And ours is going to be 15. So it's a little bit easier to homer over the top of this. But I like the look of it. I think it's still going to knock down some of those line drive home runs. And then throwing this little piece at the end. It, there's actually a little bit of space between those two seating sections, but there's kind of a, an illusion here where you really can't tell. So I'm just going to keep it that way and we'll adjust the, the wall here a little bit. That right field corner is 325. At the Metrodome, it is 327. And then we're going to extend the wall out a lot further because we don't want the right center gap to be too easy to homer to. So you either need to have a deeper fence or a taller wall there. So we'll go 15 feet, a couple sections over, and then you'll notice how it, it slopes downward as you get back to the standard 8-foot fence for the rest of the gap. Now I spent more time just manipulating this, and then you start to get into these weird situations where that red dotted line means that the seating is interfering with the field of play and you have to make a change. And it doesn't mean that your seating is even clipping onto the field. It's just kind of buggy. So you have to be careful with that at times when you're getting too into the construction. Here I was just really figuring out the exact dimensions for everything along right field and wondering how far out this wall should go. When I decided to throw a third section here onto it, extending the wall further... And I really like where I've ended up with this. It offers uh, a really unique experience in right field versus left field. And it was a compromise here because I couldn't really make that area of the fence deeper because it would give me that issue where I had the red dotted line around the seating. So the compromise was just to extend the height of that 15 foot wall. I thought about putting this last section here and I just couldn't get that to cooperate nicely. So I got rid of it. Then just smoothing this out so it looks a little bit better. I think we have pretty good reasonable dimensions here throughout the entire outfield. And now it's just a matter of getting these in the, the final place 
and then that slope gets a little bit longer as it transitions from 15 feet down to 8. And from this view, I really like what we've got going on there in right field. I'm happy with how that's turned out. So with the function of the stadium getting finalized, we can focus more on how everything looks and just get everything a little bit nicer. And that's not usually my strong suit here. I don't really customize a lot in games that have these in-depth creation suites. But I've tried my best to get to know this one because I want a nice new stadium that I've made. So we have options in this left center corner for what we want to add. There are some cool different, you know, sculptures or more landscape type of additions you can add in. And some look better than others, and some are obviously, you know, a little out there. But actually, I like this little baseball space portal. Like, having something here as, like, a, a target to homer to, I think would be fun. I might actually keep this one. Probably not going to have any of the kaiju in the outfield, though. With the seating here opening up a little section, we can put down the smokehouse barbecue restaurant. That's really helping fill that out. Pretty cool view from that deck as well here in right field. And then in this left field section, we can also be a bit creative with what we do. So we'll delete that and delete the most uncomfortable looking chairs I think I have ever seen. And we're putting a pool there. But then I got to thinking about some of these things and it's like you can put down, you know, picnic tables and pools and restaurants, but you can't put down people. So... Do these things look as good if they're empty? Like, I think putting a restaurant here in this section would be really neat. But if there's no people and it looks empty, are you better off putting, like, trees or just landscaping? So, I haven't yet decided on that, but I put down a bunch of stuff in that corner I want to come back to later. Now our attention shifts to the scoreboard and right. I wanted to delete that one and get uh, this one in there. And open up the back of this scoreboard. So I am using a template here. That's just what they had in place. I'll put our scoreboard right there. And I have tested this in game. It is visible from the hitting camera. But reading out like batting averages is a little small. So I don't think it does everything I need it to. I then looked at the grass patterns and the type of grass I wanted to use and I still felt like the default grass type and pattern was the best and then I went to uh, tan clay on the infield so that'll probably be what we end up going with but now we're going to change the color of the outfield wall it's no longer going to be blue that was just temporary so now we have more of an Oakland A's green do we like the the color of the seats where they are and then I was wondering now if this green was a little too much like Fenway Park. There are a couple different shades you can do. And I wanted to put like the dimensions on the actual wall like with lettering. But that's not really an option. Here are the other greens by the way. I don't know which green would be best for our seating. Or for that stadium wall. But those are all the options. And I think maybe... That second one is a bit more like the Oakland A's really dark green. There's only one way you can put numbers up, by the way, and it's those wood slats that you cannot put up against the fence like that, so I cannot paint on the dimensions. But here are the dimensions of the ballpark right now. So that right field wall, it's 15 feet all the way to 360. I think that is uh, pretty solid. I love how everything's come together there. The last thing I did is I wanted to see how things would look if we put up the retired numbers for the A's. Doesn't look good, just the numbers, especially with this more generic lettering. But including the name on there, in this case, it's number 9, Reggie Jackson. You know, it looks pretty good when you zoom out. I like it. We'd have to fill in, I think, like five more names or so, and... I think I'd like more of just a solid green board there with a bit more room. I feel like if I have to go two names next to each other, I might run out of room. But that's where I am right now. I got more work to do, but I feel like I got a lot of the tough stuff out of the way in this session. I want to have this done for Season 5's opening day. And I think that we're making pretty good progress. If you have any feedback, let me know down below if there's something you want to suggest... 
then uh, I'm still looking for ideas as I get this closer to the finish line. But that is going to do it for this episode, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this one. I really did. Please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day.